straight ahead on 12 News, how the cold weather is keeping some volunteers away. Uh, a lot of folks think that we kind of shut down when the snow hits, but it's uh, really far from the truth. We'll talk with the nonprofit that's still hard at work. Then, spirited competition as the biggest liquor store in the state opens its doors. But first, a long wait for a medal earned in battle. Today, thank you for this honor, and I did not expect it. Thank you. Why it took more than 40 years to finally get it. 12 News starts right now. A Golden Valley man finally gets a military medal that's been a long time coming. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Johnson. And I'm Alexandra Renslow. Fred Jennis is now the proud recipient of the Purple Heart. He sustained a leg injury during an enemy attack and was recognized for his sacrifice this morning at Golden Valley City Hall. But as Delane Cleveland reports, it's an honor that was 44 years in the making. On behalf of the United States Senator Amy Klobuchar, the U.S. Naval Reserve in the city of Golden Valley, we welcome you to today's Purple Heart Ceremony. There are some things in life that are worth waiting for. Let it be known that he who wears the military order of the Purple Heart has given his blood in the defense of his homeland. Only in the case of Fred Jennis. This is an award that is long overdue for a man uh, who gave so much for his country. He's had to wait a lot longer for this recognition than most. In 1969, Fred was a combat engineer in the U.S. Navy supporting the intelligence community of South Vietnam. On December 19, 1969, Fred was wounded in combat when the enemy attacked his team's compound. Despite the injury to his right leg, he never sought recognition for his sacrifice until 2004. I can't think of anyone that's so deserving so many years later as your grandpa. Only to find out the Navy had no record of his service. In those intelligence operations, it was hard to get those records. They were classified. But this past fall, Fred finally got those records. And with Senator Klobuchar's help, thank you for this honor, he finally got his special day. After 44 years, I'd like to remember the CB team, all 12 who have passed on before me. The people in his combat engineering team weren't here to see this day. Instead, Fred was surrounded by his friends and loved ones. But as he proudly wears the Purple Heart on his chest, it serves as an honor for all in his CB unit. It was a team effort, and we would have never, you know, survived uh, the six different combat actions that we were in in five months if it hadn't been a team effort. In Golden Valley, Delane Cleveland, 12 News. Fred Jennis is now retired, but he spends every week volunteering at the Minneapolis Veterans Hospital. Meantime, in addition to the Purple Heart, he also has a combat action ribbon for his service in Vietnam. A Brooklyn Center woman is dead after being struck by a car. The accident happened Friday night at the intersection of Osseo Road and 49th Avenue in Minneapolis. 55-year-old Alberta Geist was crossing the street when she was hit. Geist was transported to North Memorial Hospital where she later died. There's no word yet on whether alcohol was a factor. Minneapolis police continue to investigate. A New Year's celebration got out of hand over the weekend in Brooklyn Park. Just after midnight Saturday, officers responded to a report of fights happening at the Bois Savon Restaurant and Banquet Hall at 73rd and Lakeland Avenue North. Police don't know what started the initial fist fight, but that caused others to break out using fists and bottles. Eight adults were arrested for misdemeanor charges, including disorderly conduct. We're also going to work with uh, co-enforcement to take a look here at the business here to make sure that everything was in compliance with the liquor license that's been in place now. And we'll work through that here over the course of the next week. Some people did have minor injuries such as scrapes and cuts. In rain, shine, or extreme cold like we have right now, Habitat for Humanity is building houses. But many of its volunteers aren't as willing to work year-round. 12 News reporter Renee Bonneau tells us how the organization suffers from lack of help in the winter. About six years ago, Esther Fabes never dreamed she'd be working on a home construction site. When I started, I had never done anything other than, you know, dust and clean my own house. Now she's at one each week. She and other volunteers with the Jewish Community Relations Council help at Habitat for Humanity sites throughout the metro every Friday. I wanted to do something to give back to the community, and I like being active uh, as I age, so I decided that 
there was perhaps something that I could do. Twin Cities Habitat relies on regular volunteers like Faves to keep work moving during the slow months. A lot of folks think that we kind of shut down when the snow hits, but it's uh, really far from the truth. We're still working full time all year long. Twin Cities Habitat knows how cold Minnesota winters get. That's why they try to schedule builds so that by the time it does get cold, most of the work is inside. And there's plenty of work to do with less help to get it done. Mostly in the summer times, the work camps, we've got those big groups every day all summer long. Once we hit the winter, we just normally have one or two groups a week. Building a house from scratch usually takes about 10 weeks, but this crystal home is taking longer because of lack of volunteers. With closing dates to meet, delays like this can't happen. Ready to paint. Fabes is proof anyone can pitch in to help as long as he or she is dedicated. You can do what you can do and you will learn a lot. In Crystal, Renee Bonneau, 12 News. Again, you don't need construction experience to volunteer for Habitat for Humanity. To sign up to help, you can go to tchabitat.org. Habitat, Veterinarians are urging people to protect their pets during this holiday season. Decorations and candy are all part of the holiday, but these things could cause problems for your pet. Staff at the Animal Wellness Center in Maple Grove say they are seeing more pets coming in from eating things like ornaments, plants, and other things they shouldn't put in their mouths. One dog I'll never forget ate an entire string of 100 miniature lights, wires and all. I didn't even believe the owner when they reported that until I took an x-ray. And then we had to go to surgery to remove it. So ornaments are a hazard, um, especially tinsel in cats, because it's attractive and it's flashy and they like to eat it, but it, they can't pass it. The experts tell us pet owners should keep holiday decorations out of reach and keep ivy, holly, and poinsettia high off the ground. They can be toxic to animals if ingested. It's also a good idea to keep your pets on their normal diets. Many spices and foods are safe for humans, of course, but not for your pets. Coming up, going big, maybe a trend in the liquor industry. We'll show you one example in Maple Grove. Later in sports, local players help North Dakota State's football team back into the national championship. But first, the deep freeze is back just in time for Christmas. Your AccuWeather forecast is up next. Hi, I'm Senior Airman Joshua Nauman, stationed out at Anderson Air Force Base, Guam. The Nauman family would like to wish a very happy holidays this season and to our friends and family in Minnesota. After a credit card breach that compromised millions of cards, some consumers are now taking Target to court. At least three Minnesota customers have filed suit in federal court. They claim Target didn't do enough to protect their card information. They also say the retailer didn't promptly notify consumers about the security breach. The suits ask for class action status. The breach that exposed the credit and debit card information of as many as 40 million customers is still under investigation by federal authorities. Over the weekend, many consumers were back in the stores as Target offered 10 percent discounts as an apology. And at least one bank is taking precautions. J.P. Morgan Chase has placed new limits on customers who use their cards at Target between November 27th and December 15th. Those customers are limited to $100 a day in cash withdrawals and $300 a day in purchases. Over the weekend, the doors opened on the largest liquor store in the state. It's a 20,000 square foot Haskell store in Maple Grove. In this week's Business Matters, a look at why going big may reflect a larger trend in the industry. Here we are and we're ready and raring for it. Just in time for the holidays. It's definitely stocking up for some holiday cheer. The largest liquor store in the state. There is tons and tons of liquor. <laughs> is open for business. I think you'd have to go to Chicago to find a footprint bigger than this 20,000 square foot store. For John Farrell Jr. and his sons, their latest Haskells, open in the Grove, is store number 13 in the Metro, but it's more than double the size of the others. This is a, a totally new formula for us, definitely a lot more square footage than all of our normal stores. Pop the cork, because 20,000 square feet will get you a wine wall with more than 15,000 and bottles and room for wine tastings and classes. There's also a walk-through beer cooler. From my perspective, I would say more variety is better. You can see so many different 
brands. Haskell's and president, Ted you know, Farrell, so says the explosion in craft beers and craft spirits helped drive their decision to go big. You're just seeing the whole liquor industry expand, and so your store has to expand to kind of keep up with that because there's so many offerings. More space to carry more labels and more bottles for those looking to stock up for this special occasion. You need Baileys for your coffee on Christmas morning and just some Christmas wine. And the next one. Definitely we had to get open for the holidays. The new Maple Grove store will employ between 30 to 40 people. Coming up, the sounds of Christmas, including one that will soon end for another year. And up next in sports, it's a wild one as Armstrong takes on Osseo in a basketball showdown. John Jacobson has that and more when we come right back. Hi, my name is Specialist Brandon Sular, Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, wishing everybody back home in Coon Rapids, Minnesota, happy holidays. John Jacobson with Sports Now, and we have, what, two stories about uh, local athletes that have gone on to college and now are in a national championship situation, right? right? National spotlight, and uh, they, they've learned well here and now have gone on and continued their crafts in sports. Armstrong High School graduate and Plymouth native Dominique Thompson helped lead the University of Wisconsin to its first ever national title match in volleyball. The Badgers met five-time champion Penn State on Saturday night in Seattle. Thompson had a good match, leading her team with 16 kills and five blocks. But Penn State was too much, winning three games to one. As a number 12 seed in the tournament, Wisconsin was the lowest seed to ever advance to the championship. Thompson has one year of eligibility remaining. The North, the North Dakota State University football team marched in the, into the FCS national title game by clobbering the University of New Hampshire on Friday. Latino Grace graduate John Crockett rushed for 195 yards, including the 71-yard sprint to the seven-yard line on the Bison's first play from scrimmage in the second half. Wyzetta High School grad Grant Olson is a senior linebacker for NDSU, but he's been out since October with a knee injury. He's given a nice send-off by teammates and coaches, though, in the fourth quarter. The Bison will play for their third straight national championship on January 4th against Towson State. The game is in Frisco, Texas. A preseason number one team, the Wyzetta Trojans hockey squad, had dropped three of its first eight games. Boys met Maple Grove for a second time this season as they hosted the Crimson Saturday afternoon. Up 1-0 in the second period, the Crimson will add another. Joe Norenberg with a long pass onto the stick of Dane Abernathy, who scores on the breakaway. Maple Grove leads it 2-0. Wyzetta gets on the board here. Billy Duma puts the puck out front. Mark Senden shoots and scores for the Trojans, and it's 2-1. to one. The Crimson, though, go back ahead by two goals. Sam Valerius with the rush goes behind the net, and his pass out to Evan Augustine. He taps it in for a goal. It's 3-1 Grove after two. Third period, trailing by a goal. Wyzetta ties it. Jack Sorensen stick handles his way out front and scores. And it's a 3-3 game through regulation. Very early in overtime, Wyzetta's number nine, Chad Olson, takes control of the puck, skates behind the net. His centering pass goes off a Crimson player and in. And for the second time this season, Wyzetta beats Maple Grove in overtime. Four to three is the final. Also in boys hockey, Como Park visiting Cooper. A great rush by Cooper sophomore Trey Rooney. He fires the wrist shot home, and the Hawks grab the lead about six minutes in. Como answers with a great deflection goal. Poor Will converts Zach Lee's pass, and it's a 1-1 game. Cooper's Keegan Houston is busy early. He makes 19 saves in the first period to keep it even. Second period, Bronson McLeod shoots for Cooper, and it deflects off of Riley Cass. Cass gets credit for the goal, and it's a 2-1 game. Houston holds off a Cougars flurry after that goal as Como tries to tie it up. And then Cooper gets a five-minute power play, and Nathan Linderholm blocks a dump-in attempt and heads the other way and scores on a wrist shot. It's Cooper up 2-1 to one after two. After a Cougars goal, Rooney gets his second of the night, and Cooper wins for the second time this season. 4-2 Hawks is the final. Armstrong had not defeated Osseo in boys basketball since the 2007 Section 5 final. The Falcons look to end their six-game skid against the Orioles. First half of this one, and the Falcons get the ball left side to Evan Nolan, who hits a three-pointer. 22 points in the game for the junior. 
Wheeler Baker can also shoot the long ball. Norio Sr. knocks down a triple here. That gives Asu a nine point lead of 25 16. Nice entry pass by the Falcons. It gets into Sean Burns, who scores inside. Burns had a big game, too. He nets 22. Late first half. It's Baker on the move. He takes the pass, drives, and scores. Baker scores 41 points in the night, one short of the school record at Osseo. Second half, and Armstrong's Melvin Newburn drives and dumps the pass to Nolan in the low post. He scores. And the Falcons fight their way back into the game, and they force overtime. Early in OT, Osseo's Jordan Dembley misses the three-pointer, but Ian Tyson gets the rebound and put back for two of his 21, and the Orioles are in the lead. But Armstrong stages the final rally of the game. Nolan breaks a 73-all tie with this catch-and-shoot three-pointer. Armstrong wins it over Osseo, 84-79. The Falcons are now 6-1. Fun way for them to head into the holiday break on a, on a victory they can enjoy for a few days. I say it, thanks a lot, John. Mm -hmm. Still ahead, those bell ringers are about to go silent until next year. We'll take a look at how the Salvation Army bell ringing campaign is doing. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Staff Sergeant Robert Mazur, deployed in Kandahar, Afghanistan. I want to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to Donna Robinson. Golden Valley, Minnesota. Merry Christmas, Mom. I love you. Well, Santa and his reindeer are getting in a little playtime before the big night. We found this holiday light display at 115 Lawn Terrace in Golden Valley. And there are lots of well-decorated yards in the Northwest Metro this year, despite the fact that winter seemed to come a little earlier than usual. Well, it was a good weekend for the Salvation Army's Red Kettles. The group raised nearly $500,000 in donations, but they're still hoping to bring in more dollars to meet their goal. We are looking for a lot more people to help us in donations. Even though it's cold outside, Bradley Scarborough says he doesn't mind standing outside ringing the bell. This is his first time volunteering, and he says he'll gladly brave the cold to help others. It's kind of hard. I got heat warmers in my shoes and my gloves, so I should be cool. The Salvation Army is hoping to raise at least $10 million by the end of the year. The bell ringing campaign ends Tuesday night, and the kettles will be gone for another year after Christmas Eve. But you can still help out online at SalvationArmyNorth.org. And that does it for us. Thanks so much for joining us. As we say goodbye, we'd like to share music of the season and the talents of the Armstrong High School Combined Chamber Ensembles.